Welcome to Getting There, What Does Mobility Mean to You? This webinar series is brought to you by Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, the National MS Society, and the MS Society of Canada. I'm going to turn things over to our speakers this evening, uh, and they are both uh, together uh, this evening in, in the great state of Nebraska, go Cornhuskers. Uh, so we have Kathy Healy, who is a, a nurse practitioner, and we have Mandy Warrig, a physical therapist. So I'm going to turn things over to Kathy and Mandy and let them introduce themselves. Welcome, Kathy and Mandy. Thank you. Well, my name is Kathy Healy, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'm a nurse practitioner, and I also have a PhD in neuroscience and have worked in the field since 1998. And I am so grateful and honored and blessed to work with Mandy uh, in our community. And so, Mandy, take it from here. So. I too am very blessed. Kathy and I get to work together professionally and take care of the folks living with MS in the Omaha, Nebraska area. So Kathy, it's great to be able to present with you tonight. My name is Mandy Rorick. I'm a physical therapist out of Omaha. I specialize in working with folks who have MS as well as those with balance and vestibular disorders. And that being said, we're going to go ahead and take it away. These are our objectives for this evening, to understand that optimal mobility is safe mobility, be familiar with the symptoms that impact mobility, identify which medical interventions, equipment options, and exercise strategies can help to manage common mobility challenges, and lastly, but certainly not least, is to be empowered to advocate for your mobility in your community. So we want to introduce, to those of you who may not know, this is the wise Dr. Randy Shapiro. He is one of our founding fathers of Can Do Multiple Sclerosis. And one of the key messages that Randy has said throughout his career is the key to managing disability is mobility. Find your way to keep moving, find your way to be mobile, and that's going to allow you to optimally manage this disease. So keep that in your mind. The key to managing disability is mobility. So what does mobility mean to you and where do you want to go? Does it mean improving, transferring to your wheelchair to go to the bathroom or even moving better in bed or getting into a car? Does it mean improving a five mile walk to work or correcting a foot drop to better get upstairs? Does it mean getting the energy you want to go to an exercise facility or getting the energy to go to church? Or does it mean to get to your kids and grandkids football game? The goal is to get you on the road to where you want to go and what you want to do how can you get where you want to go when MS symptoms interfere? How do you guys do that? So mobility challenges are complicated and rarely occur in isolation. Uh, so what else is new? MS is complicated. Just like a fingerprint, MS mobilities issues are unique to each individual. Generally, mobility problems can be an interplay between muscle weakness, sensory disturbance, and balance problems. Importantly, mobility challenges can, um, other in influence can be your vision, your mood, your energy level, and even your bowel and your bladder. Concepts to keep in mind, for every degree and type of mobility are actually pretty simple. And to quote again, we're going to keep driving this uh, home, uh, as said by our fearless leader, Randy Shapiro, as well as our beloved founder of Can Do, Jimmy Huga, we'll say it again. The key to managing disability is mobility. Also, importantly, be your own investigator. Ask yourself, where do I want to go, and what is prohibiting me from getting there? And very, very importantly, is to prevent injury and have safe mobility. So 
So our eyes are essential for mobility, from turning in bed to getting into the bathroom or driving across country. Visual issues can interfere with getting there and also with being there. So common in MS is optic neuritis. Over 50% of you probably have had an event of optic neuritis. It usually involves loss of vision. It's generally in the central visual field and most likely kind of characteristic of optic neuritis is pain behind the eye. Good thing, there's pretty good recovery in bouts of optic neuritis because those optic tracts are very robust and redundant. However, some people will not gain their vision completely back. In addition to that, after an optic neuritis, there can be color vision uh, changes and also a difference in contrast and in brightness of your vision. Eye movement disorders are also fairly common in multiple sclerosis and they result uh, from lesions generally in the brain stem and connecting fibers. So symptoms you might have with eye movement disorders are blurred vision, but it's due to overlapping versus acuity. There also may be double vision or shaky vision. Don't forget that age-related changes can happen too. And in fact, as we age, there can be refractory changes. Um, the most common is called presbyopia. Many of you probably know that it's called farsightedness. So if you're reading your book at a distance or reading a menu at a distance, likely that is age related change and can be corrected. However, as we age, there can be other things that come up too. And we have to be cognizant of those things like cataracts, macular degeneration and retinal issues. Mandy's gonna talk a little bit about the impact on mobility. So clearly, vision can have a huge impact on how you move. If we think just about decreased vision or low vision, uh, that poor visual acuity can, because of, beca can be caused by that optic neuritis or because, because of age-related changes. But overall, that can limit your ability to navigate around that obstacle or avoid that trip hazard. Secondly, that gaze instability. That gaze instability is what Kathy was describing. So the inner ear communicates with the brain and our eye muscles through a reflex called the vestibular ocular reflex. And that VOR, that vestibular ocular reflex, can be interrupted by these pathways Kathy was referring to in the brain and in the brainstem specifically. So it almost creates this bit of a bad home movie sensation is what patients describe to me, that they turn their head or they turn their body and there's this lag. So that gaze instability can cause a huge, um, a, a tremendous amount of difficulty on how someone moves, how someone stays balanced, and certainly can increase risk for someone's uh, falls, or excuse me, certainly increase fall risk rather. So Kathy, tell us a little bit about how steroids and how other things can impact our vision and how that can impact our mobility. So uh, with a bout of an acute optic neuritis, um, and that means a recent event associated with inflammation in the optic tract, sometimes people are given steroids. Um, and sometimes they are not given steroids. It depends on the intensity and the um, how your symptoms are and what your visual acuity is. But steroids are given, the important thing to remember after a bout of optic neuritis is that it could take up to three to six months for complete recovery. Generally, if we give steroids, the recovery is much quicker. So when scheduling a regular ophthalmology visit, it may be important to wait that amount of time to stabilize vision and then get corrected. Also, some other tricks we can do is because the contrast sensitivity may be less after an optic neuritis, lighting in rooms makes a huge difference. Even the contrast in our devices, like our iPhones or computers, um, after about of optic neuritis, it's difficult. Uh, sometimes that can be different and brightness or font can be increased or enhanced. 
Corrective lenses um, are interesting, especially with problems with eye movements. Mm -hmm. So as we age, many times we're put into what we call pro progressives or bifocals. If you have an issue with eye movements, that can be a little bit challenging because eye movement is required to place the eyes in the correct area of the lens. So sometimes we advise patients to get larger lenses and not those tiny little glasses where your progressives, there's just a very small area of sweet spot. And also um, when double vision is an issue, potentially even two different types of glasses right. uh, for near vision, far vision. With frank double vision, eye patching is good. So if you patch an eye, then the double vision resolves. Uh, and that sometimes you can get double vision towards the end of the evening when you get fatigued, and sometimes simply patching an eye can be helpful. So some of these things that Kathy's suggesting, you can work with your healthcare team, you can work with a neuro-ophthalmologist is a key healthcare provider to maybe consider chatting with if you feel like some of these issues are interfering with your mobility. But in addition to these things that Kathy's identified for us already, vestibular rehabilitation is often an option for people to help to help people address that kind of gaze instability or the shakingness or the bad home movie sensation, if you will, that people get in their in their vision when they move. So these are just a couple of studies that support vestibular rehabilitation um, exercises and, and related balance activities for people with MS, as well as for people who use mobility aids. So just, just because you use a mobility aid doesn't mean that these types of exercises might not also be helpful for you too. So I'm just going to demonstrate a couple of these exercises, what a vestibular exercise may look like. And again, this is one that specifically addresses the vestibular ocular reflex. So you would focus your eyes on a target. And as your eyes are on the target, you would move your head side to side with the goal of keeping your eyes on that target. For some folks who have gaze instability issues, it might shake a little bit or slip off of the target. That would just be a sign that this may be an exercise that might be appropriate for you. So this is VOR times one, vestibular ocular reflex exercise times one. Now, certainly talk with your healthcare provider, talk with your physical therapist, particularly someone who understands vestibular rehabilitation, to see if these types of exercises might help with your overall mobility. So sensory symptoms can also affect getting there. And there are a variety of different sensory symptoms. Um, pain is considered a sensory symptom, and almost half of individuals with multiple scler sclerosis have chronic pain. And that means pain that has persisted for over six months. And it's the same, it waxes and wanes, but it's generally identifiable. Also, persons with MS have something called paresthesias. And this can be more described as annoying, numby, tingling sensation that generally can be tolerated, but it's there. Again, um, it's annoying and it can also vary in severity. And then also another sensory symptom is absence of sensation. Uh, so I have people come into the clinic saying, well, I don't have any pain whatsoever, probably because I'm numb. And there's ways that we can identify some of these things on our examination when we see uh, people in clinic, especially an absence of sensation on exam. And so that's why uh, you may see your neurologist or your MS clinician take out tuning forks and check for sensation or pins to check for pain perception. But basically, a vibratory sense is applying a vibration to a bony structure, and we usually use the great toe. Mandy, do you feel that? No. Okay, <laughs> so that's an alert to me as a clinician that she has some loss of sensation. And so that can affect mobility, obviously, and also place Mandy at a higher risk for fall because she just can't 
sense that position sense that her foot is in space. So that definitely can impact mobility. So I'll actually add to that right at the moment. So if your feet are numb or the sensation in your feet or in your legs are altered, that input that the feet and the legs are supposed to give via the spinal cord up to the brain is interfered. It's scrambled. It's compromised. So if you think about it, if the input from the feet and from the legs are compromised, then the brain's output or integration analysis of that compromised information to tell the body how to move in response to that is going to be compromised also. So if the sensory input is interfered, then the motor output may be interfered or compromised also. And this can be consistent with not only just the feet like we demoed, and that can impact walking and balance, but it can also impact your hands, right? So if, if your fingers are numb, it may be difficult to, to do zippers. It may be dip, difficult to button buttons. So, so numbness and sensory changes can really impact uh, mobility in general. And then I'll go back to that first bullet. Pain, pain can change movement also. Yeah. Um, certainly if, if someone has low back pain, for example, and they're favoring that, or if they're having um, pain in their foot or their ankle because of edema, they're changing their movement pattern, and the result of that can be uh, deviation of balance, can be um, increased, increased mobility challenges as well. So sens sensation is huge, perhaps a little um, underrepresented. So just one other little anecdote, as we were talking about sensation, we have something in clinics called the Romberg, and that's where you stand with your feet together and you close your eyes. Mm -hmm. So when there's a lack of sensation in the feet, generally that person will fall over. Um, so it demonstrates how important vision is, mm -hmm. uh, especially when we have some decrease in sensation. And so... You all may have noticed, like it, sometimes when people get into the shower, they close their eyes to wash their hair, being very off balance. That's just a, a sign of that sort of thing, you know, in your own environment. So this graph is pretty busy, and basically it talks about types of pain and multiple sclerosis. Um, so there's also, it should be said that there is a, acute pain, and that acute pain is something that we all have to pay attention to. Um, many times we have MS and say, oh, that's just my MS. But if it's a new and intense pain, that needs to be checked out. That your body's saying, hey, something's going on here. Versus a chronic pain you're familiar with. You've had it for over six months. But acute pain really needs to be defined uh, and identified and then treated. So generally with chronic pain, all those types of pain we talked about, um, there can be burning pain, there can be pain from spasticity, there can be pins and needles pain, there can be all those sorts of pain. So generally, um, in multiple sclerosis, we use um, classifications of medications, if we use meds, um, generally for what we use in seizure disorders. And those are things like gabapentin, um, carbamazepine, things like that. Um, also, pain can be related to spasticity, and at least medically, we can use antispasticity drugs. The whole concept of treating chronic pain, pain that is there, it's really a balancing act because all these medications that are listed here, they're also conservative measures. All the medications can potentially make you fatigued and potentially contribute to weakness, too. So it really, really is a balancing act, and if conservative measures can be utilized and lower doses of medication, that's better, because then you have more energy. Um, one thing just kind of to remember about pain medications is you never want to change your dose, stop your dose abruptly without talking to your providers, um, your neurologists or your primary care um, providers. Another way to, to think about pain medication is many providers will dose a little bit higher at bedtime or at night to improve sleep and lower during the day. Um, but you really have to have a good relationship with your provider and be able to talk about these things because, you know, certainly there is pain in multiple sclerosis.
Trigeminal neuralgia is one thing I wanted to talk about, and that is a pain symptom that is relatively common in multiple sclerosis, and it is this sharp shooting pain down the facial area that usually comes from the trigeminal nerve. This pain can be chronic, it's intermittent, and it can um, interfere with your ability to do almost anything, meaning going out of your home, trying to get to places, eating, brushing your teeth, anything like that. That pain is one pain that you want to get under control because it can be very, very wearing and cause depression. So Kathy, are there any other medications that can help with sensory changes? So as far as sensory changes, if there's absence of sensation, then there are no medications to help with absence of sensation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can look at it, well, I don't have any pain, but yet my sensation is absent. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as medications, like we talked about, really the, the drugs that we use for seizures and for spasticity are kind of the mainstays and medications I use to treat pain and multiple sclerosis. But there's also numerous amount of conservative therapy too. Right. So one of the main questions we are asked in PT is, is what are what are the best kind of shoes? What is what is the best footwear for me? And believe it or not, there is not one answer, just like anything else in MS. There's it's highly individualized. I would say a general rule of thumb though, however, is to, if you are somebody who has decreased sensation in your feet, um, it's best not to have a shoe with too much cushion. If you have too much cushion, then it's almost like standing on a cushion all day, every day. It kind of compromises or scrambles, if you will, that message to the brain about where your balance is. Versus if you're in a nice firm soled shoe, then it just gives a little bit firmer message, if you will, to your brain about where your balance is. We'll pick up where we left off, rehabilitation strategies. So we talked about footwear. We'll talk briefly about insoles. So there's some emerging research about the value of vibratory insoles um, and also potentially textured insoles for people with multiple sclerosis to heighten the sensory input that the feet are getting about balance and mobility. So kind of keep your keep your eyes and ears open for that. We haven't um, firmly determined the effectiveness of that, but it's something that's being investigated. Balance training, where you can work on practicing balance strategies and doing specific exercises that can help um, with your particular balance strategies. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, are the assistive devices. Um, you know, I think Kathy used the example when people um, uh, have their vision is compromised maybe when their eyes are closed in the bathtub or maybe if you're walking outside on an uneven surface and it's dark or dim light so you can't see as well the vision's compromised the feet are compromised because it's an uneven surface and you may have a little bit of numbness so you're really just reliant on one of the three sensory symptoms systems rather to help you with your balance so it's really important to maybe consider an assistive device in certain circumstances and the rehab professionals, particularly PT, can help you figure out when that's appropriate. But there can also be other non-MS causes for sensory changes. So Kathy, do Yeah, again, that. just because um, you have MS doesn't mean you don't get anything else. And again, with aging, um, there can be other things that creep up like peripheral neuropathies, um, things that are uh, responsible for those sensory changes that are not MS, sometimes can be diabetes, thyroid dysfunction, um, sometimes B12 deficiencies. So all those things tend to be a little bit more prevalent as we age. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind. So in addition to sensory changes, there's also mobility, the impact that spasticity and strength can have on your mobility. So spasticity is that tightness. Some people describe it as the heaviness. It's that resistance to movement that you can feel. It's a symptom of some type of condition going on in the central nervous system. And spasticity can impact strength. It can sometimes uh, interfere with strength and other times it may be helpful. And we'll just kind of explore this relationship in the next couple slides. 
So what is the difference between primary muscle weakness and secondary muscle weakness? Primary muscle weakness is what you experience as a result of the demyelination, um, whereas secondary weakness can be the result of compensations, it can be the result of deconditioning, and maybe even to a certain extent spasticity. So you can also have secondary weakness. Um, common muscle groups that are impacted are primarily your hip flexors. So that's the muscle that, if I stand up and you may be able to see that, the hip flexors are those muscles that are on the front of the thigh, quadriceps, front of the upper thigh, excuse me, like the hip crease. They help to lift your leg with, with walking. Quadriceps muscle, muscle on the front of the thigh. Hamstring muscle, muscle on the back of the thigh. Dorsiflexors are the muscles on the front of the lower leg. Tricep muscles, on the other hand, I'll just show on Kathy. Tricep muscles are the muscles on the back of the upper arm, and then your wrist extensors are the muscles on the front of the upper arm. The relevance of these, in particular with mobility, let's talk about um, the hip flexors that helps to swing the leg through with walking. The quadriceps and the hamstrings can help with stability of the knee while you're putting uh, your weight down through your knee. The tricep muscles and the wrist extensors really can impact your ability to transfer or push up with a transfer, as well as wheelchair propulsion. So, for example, if your wrist extensor muscles aren't sufficiently strong, you can kind of end up with your, um, your, your wrist kind of coming downward like that. And when it's downward like that, then it's hard to make a good grip. Try to take a good grip, Kathy. See how you can't, you can't make a good grip if your wrist is flexed but sufficient wrist extension, a good strength of those muscles there allow you to have a good grip for things like transfers and wheelchair propulsion. So big impact on mobility. So some management strategies to help with muscle weakness are, are these strength training guidelines. Certainly um, these are highly individualized and can be um, customized with the help of your rehab team to your specific needs. Some examples of a couple exercises based on those muscle groups we just talked about would be the tricep dips. So Kathy will show you those tricep dips that you can do to strengthen those muscles on the back of the upper arm and how that helps with um, kind of giving you that boost or that lift for a transfer. Another example would be a sit to stand muscle strengthening exercise. So it's just like it sounds, it's coming from a seated position to a standing position, as you can see with Kathy there, and working those gluteal muscles, those quadriceps muscles on the front of the upper thigh, and those muscles are the muscles that can help to contribute uh, with ease of transfers. And the speed at which you do those and the height from which you do them can be varied based on your specific needs. Great, thanks Kathy. Kathy. Don't plop in your chair. No plopping. No. <laughs> Use those <laughs> muscles to lower yourself down. That's where those get stronger, too. Yes. So we can work on strength. We can work on addressing some of these weakness issues. But sometimes spasticity can be a part of this equation. So Kathy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what spasticity is, spasticity is rather, and how it contributes to mobility. So spasticity is, is an upper motor symptom, meaning that there's lesions in the motor tracts, which can be uh, those long uh, axons in the spinal cord or the motor areas in the brain. So spasticity generally to all of us indicates a sudden involuntary flexing or extending of a limb or jerking of muscles. Um, generally, it's associated with hyperreflexia, so that, you know, when some when a clinician hits you in the knee with a hammer, you're hyperreflexive. That goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, so you feel stiffness or tightness when muscles are even at rest, and it's difficult to relax or stretch them. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with spasticity is that it can be painful and it may also disturb sleep. And that's when really it can become a vicious cycle. So it's important to treat your spasticity. Spasticity can also fluctuate. And that's the tricky thing about it. So you don't want to over medicate based upon some intermittent spasticity that is occasional during the day. 
Um, there's a word about what's called clonus, and you may all ex experience that, but clonus is a, a beating of a limb. And in the, in the leg, it generally is um, a beating of the foot. I don't know if you can see this. But that's similar to what clonus is. And although it generally is not painful. So, so that's the important thing. It is annoying and sometimes it's embarrassing. Uh, but some of those medications can help with clonus. But usually it's an intermittent phenomenon and doesn't necessarily have to be treated. So gentle pressure on the limb usually settles down clonus. Um, and then another thing to remember is that spasticity is not all, always interferes with your mobility. And in fact, sometimes it's helpful for mobility or for standing because that tight muscle can actually keep people upright. It can give a sense of stability. Yes. Yep. Yes. yep. So common spasticity triggers, this can be anything that's what we call noxious, anything that's painful or startling or cold or, so um, just even stretching your muscles uh, too quickly or too vigorously can induce spasticity. Moving an arm or a leg quickly, anxiety and stress can make it worse. Uh, any irritation such as rubbing, uh, chafing, uh, uh, ingrown toenail or something painful, something hot or cold. I get a lot of people in the winter who sit on a leather seat in their car and a uh, leg becomes extremely um, spastic. So pressure sores are another uh, uh, entity, uh, a very dreaded complication of immobility that can cause increase in spasticity. And very important infections can cause an increase in spasticity. Many times urinary tract, constipation, hemorrhoids, a full bladder, um, any sort of injury, um, also, binders, wraps, even braces that um, are causing undue pressure can kick up spasticity. So pay attention to what's causing it because otherwise we really can't treat it. And definitely it does interfere with your ability to get there. Absolutely. It's not, it's actually interesting. Sometimes in, in rehabilitation, we can see when somebody has a very full or irritated bladder yes. because they yes. move much differently and then they yes. use the restroom and then they come back to their therapy session and it's their better. movement is freer, it's better, they feel more comfortable. So the bladder can definitely be a trigger. So one thing to know about spasticity, it doesn't necessarily mean your MS is getting worse or you're having a relapse. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's important, as we talked about, just to check for an infection. Um, we do have medications that we use that are traditional medications we use for spasticity, like baclofen or tizanidine, and there are other medications too. Um, sometimes a baclofen pump is used, especially if uh, people are getting too sedated with their oral spasticity medications, baclofen pumps. Uh, can be helpful because the baclofen is just given directly, what we call intrathecally. So generally reducing spasticity into that area below where the baclofen pump is placed. So generally the legs. Uh, Botox can be helpful too because it doesn't have any general sedation. However, um, it's usually used in smaller areas of spasticity versus very large areas. Uh, so, but uh, mainstay of spasticity, and uh, Mandy will talk more about this, is certainly uh, stretching and rehabilitation. Right. I mean, I think we get the best uh, effects when, best management of spasticity when it is coupled with stretching. And here are some different stretching and flexibility guidelines. Again, you really need to work with your rehab team to identify those muscle groups that need to be stretched and, and to what extent they need to be stretched, and, and truly also in, in the best manner that they need to be stretched, whether it be individually, with a partner, or with equipment. Um, some examples might be, say you, you have drop foot with, related to your mobility. Sometimes doing a calf stretch for the muscle on the back of the lower leg can really be helpful. Or some folks have a lot of trouble swinging their leg through with walking. And it's not necessarily weakness as much as it is maybe some spasticity or tightness of that hamstring muscle, that muscle on the back of the thigh that's limiting that ability to advance or swing that leg through. So 
again, considering um, the bigger pictures and the movement, your rehab team can kind of help you dissect that and where it needs to be, be addressed. So now that we've spoken a little bit about spasticity, let's talk about fatigue. And this is oh. just an adorable picture, so we'll just spend a moment looking at that. But fatigue is really, really common, right, Kathy? Like, we hear it all the time. Very common. 80% of people with MS yeah. report fatigue. Mm -hmm. And it can worsen all MS symptoms. We, we definitely see that, and, and certainly it can impact mobility. But one thing about fatigue, again, is to make sure it's nothing else. Um, a lot of things can cause fatigue. It's a very non-specific symptom. Uh, people with other diseases have a lot of fatigue too. So generally what we do in clinic is, you know, check a blood count. You could be anemic. Check a thyroid. You could be hyper, hypothyroid. Definitely we also know that sleep problems are more associated or more free, more found in persons with multiple sclerosis, like sleep apnea, and that can influence uh, how someone feels throughout the day. Uh, vitamin deficiencies. There's there's a lot of things uh, that can cause fatigue, so that's important to know. And again, you got to be investigators. You and your physicians have to be investigators and get to the source, identify the source of your fatigue. And we just love that little guy's face. We can just look at him all night. <laughs> but I think we're going to have to change the slide, unfortunately. <laughs> so we've, we've touched on this a little bit already, but the, there are two different types of fatigue. Primary fatigue, which is that fatigue that Kathy was talking about that's unique to folks with MS. It can occur even if you've had a great night's sleep. You can still feel very, very tuckered out. It can generally be aggravated by heat, but I would also argue it can be aggravated by cold too. So those kind of extremes of weather can aggravate uh, fatigue. It can come on easily and suddenly, um, and it's certainly more intense and, and likely to interfere with function. So that primary fatigue is, is challenging, and there are many different ways where you can manage that. Um, however, due to the, the focus of this webinar, we won't talk about that, but um, I would steer you to some of our webinars that Can Do MS already has archived that specifically talk about fatigue. But Kathy, any other comments about secondary issues? Well, secondary fatigue. fatigue. I mean, we know that there's a muscle fatigue also, like a short circuiting, mm -hmm. um, or especially when um, individuals with multiple sclerosis overheat, there can be an, an actual muscle fatigue. And then also we talked about poor sleep, deconditioning, uh, mood changes. It's important to know that fatigue is can be a very classical symptom associated with depression too. So there could be a depression, um, inadequate nutrition, uh, just not eating well. Being um, it's important to keep your BMI uh, where it should be because being overweight can cause fatigue. Uh, being underweight uh, can also contribute to con fatigue. Side effect of medications. And that is really, really important. So um, screen all your medications. Make sure that they're, uh, there's a reason that you're on them, that many of the medications can cause fatigue. Right. And of course, we talked about the other non-MS causes. So fatigue, just like other things, are very, very complex. Yes. So now that we've kind of looked at uh, the symptoms, some of the more common symptoms that can contribute to mobility challenges, Let's talk about the mobility challenge a bit more broadly and, and kind of break down and look at it from the other direction. So let's talk about mobility challenges related to gait. So this is just, these are a, a few common gait deviations. Now certainly this list isn't all inclusive, but some of the ones we see more commonly in the clinic. So difficulty in dancing the involved legs. So again, that might be related to difficulty swing that leg through could be related to weakness of those hip flexor muscles like we talked about, or it could be some of that tightness of that those hamstring muscles on the back of the upper thigh that are like a rubber band pulling that and resisting that movement. Your toes could be dragging. You could have something called drop foot or foot drop. Um, that can be contributed from weakness of the those dorsiflexor muscles or those muscles on the front of the lower leg. Um, but it can also be aggravated by spasticity in the calf muscle too. So it could be a little bit of both. 
Um, the knee could buckle forward or, or hyperextend backwards. That knee instability can be caused by, by weakness and spasticity of those muscles surrounding the knee, so the calf, the quadriceps muscle, the hamstring muscle. And lastly, but certainly not least, is the shuffling. So sometimes we see people who have reduced sensory input mm -hmm. to their feet and to their legs. They shuffle a little bit. It's almost like the nervous system's um, subconscious way of, of trying to increase that sensory input by creating that friction, that extra friction with the ground. So that shuffling can be a common problem in in walking as well. But there are some ways we can manage it. So Kathy, why don't you tell us about the way we know with medication? There is a medication called uh, delphamphrodine and the trade name is called Empira and you probably have heard about it. Um, but this is for, for persons who are ambulating and it increases the action potential or the conduction around generally on the long axons, the myelinated axons. Um, it's used in all types of MS. It's the only uh, medication that is specifically FDA approved for MS and for gait dysfunction. So the trial uh, showed that in about half of the individuals, there was a significant increase in walking uh, speed or efficacy, and they actually me measured walking speed. Um, so it's dosed every 12 hours, it's extended release, it is contraindicated in persons who have had seizure or in renal insufficiency, and we actually have to do a calculation for that. And what's really important to know is that it doesn't work in everyone. Uh, in fact, um, about 50% of people it may not work in. Um, if it works, generally you know it. Um, it is quite profound, uh, the effect. Uh, so, you know, um, Importantly, if you feel like you may be a candidate, discuss it with your MS clinician. So in addition to Ampira and, and other strategies you can use to manage those gait deviations, you can really engage that rehab team. Yes. And we use strategies that we've touched on earlier. So resistance training exercises, flexibility, gait and balance training, and certainly using some assistive devices as needed and as appropriate. So, but I think we had a, one of the questions was that, um, can we get stronger with rehab? Yeah, and you absolutely can yes. get stronger with, with physical therapy and rehabilitation. And I think the key is finding the ways, the, the different exercises and the ways that you can get stronger. You have to work with your rehab team to help figure out the best approach to that. So we can't talk about walking issues without touching a little bit on foot drop or our difficulty advancing the limb. So there are different types of bracing options available to us. We've listed a couple options here. Um, so an ankle foot orthosis or AFO. This is just an example of one of the many kinds that are out there. They can be customized made of a, of a hard plastic or they can be made of a carbon fiber and are ordered more of an off-the-shelf prefabricated type. There's also a device called a hip flexion. Let me back up. The ankle foot orthosis, the, the intent of that brace is to help pick the foot up, pick the ankle and the foot up and keep it so that when you swing it like through with walking that those toes aren't, aren't striking the ground or catching the ground. Now sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes it's not just insufficient toe lift that's contributing to inability to advance the limb. Sometimes it's also insufficient hip flexion. That's where uh, an, a device called the hip flexion assist device may be helpful. So hip flexion assist device is a device that you just wrap around the waist. There are bungee cords that run along the inside inner thigh and outer thigh down to the lower leg and attach an anchor at the shoe and it picks up the whole leg with walking. So that can help um, give a little extra boost to the hip flexor muscles that may be affected by BMS. And lastly is the functional, are the functional electrical stimulation devices that are out there. So these are the devices that stimulate the nerve to, to stimulate the muscle to pick up the toes with walking. So it, it, they're usually a, a cuff that's worn around the top of the lower leg, and there's a 
uh, two electrodes, one electrode that stimulates that nerve and one electrode that stimulates that muscle, and basically it bypasses the central nervous system just directly stimulating that area to allow you to pick up your feet or your foot and ankle with walking. The two devices that are out there, one is the Bioness and one is the Walk-Aid, they use different uh, mechanisms and some are more effective and helpful for, for other people. So again, explore those with your PT, explore those with your rehab team. And often um, orthotists are also helpful healthcare providers for helping you determine which brace is the best for you. So now we come to a common mobility problem and, and that's falls. And most of you sitting there likely have had falls. So falls are very common in people with multiple sclerosis and especially in more progressive forms of MS. So secondary progressive, primary progressive. Um, in fact, those individuals are twice as likely to fall than people with relapsing remitting forms of MS. 70% of people with MS fall on a regular basis at about greater than 26 falls per year per person with secondary MS. And more than 10%, and this is really important, more than 10% of these falls lead to injury. Injuries like fractures or um, sprains, um, and sometimes even worse, some can lead to head injuries. Uh, so one out of 10 falls leads to something uh, not good. Mm -hmm. So that's so important to, to keep us front, to be able to get there is to prevent this injury. So people with MS are three times more likely to sustain a fracture than the general population. And falling and fear of falling leads to activity curtailment, really social isolation, and it can be a downward spiral of immobility, and especially if there's injury. Right. I've seen many people uh, get hospitalized for fractures and really not come out of the hospital um, back to their baseline. And um, it's really, really challenging after something like that to get back to your baseline. So the important thing here is prevention. I and that's all. Could not agree yeah. with you more. Fear is, fear is a huge driver for when someone has a fall, particularly a fall with an injury. Um, it becomes really, really difficult to return to that previous level of, of mobility. Yes. So, so why are falls common? Why are falls complex? We've kind of touched on this already throughout, especially when we've talked about the different symptoms that can contribute to balance. But just to recap and review, um, sensory input from your ears, from your eyes, and then from those nerves in your feet, that sensory input from your feet, that sensory input is ventures up the spinal cord, ventures to the brain, where the brain integrates it, analyzes it, and says, okay, muscles, this is what you need to do. And it sends those messages back out via the vestibular ocular reflex, eye movements, and those postural muscles and postural changes in hopes of keeping us balanced and steady. But if this were all working properly, then falls wouldn't happen, right? So. I think the key message with this slide is that if you are experiencing instability, if you are experiencing um, challenges with your balance, you have got to talk to your healthcare team, really um, have a good conversation about when you feel unsteady, when you feel off balance, when you've had your falls, so that we can dissect and really think about in the context of this type of a diagram, what can, where can we intervene? Where can we intervene with exercises? Where can we intervene with compensatory strategies? And what mobility aids can be most helpful? And we have our uh, patients keep fall diaries. Maybe. Yes, yes. So really checking, uh, having a calendar, and then be, be a fall investigator. What time mm -hmm. of the day did it mm -hmm. happen? Was I hot? Was I fatigued? Was it, where was it? Was it on my way to the bathroom? All those things are so important to be able to prevent them. You have to be your own investigator. Right. right. So common, another common mobility problem, we've spoken about walking, we've spoken about falls. 
we're just going to briefly touch on wheelchairs and mobility aids. We can do MS has some nice archived webinars specifically about wheelchairs and mobility aids that I would steer you to for more comprehensive discussion about that. But we want to touch on on these two just briefly. So in, in proper fit of a mobility aid, a wheelchair or a brace can really contribute to some, some challenges. So let's talk first with a mobility aid. If you're using a walker, for example, that's too low, you're going to lean forward too much. That can contribute to poor posture. That can contribute to a shift of your center of gravity, which can make you more susceptible to falls unnecessarily. Um, another example would be with the wheelchair. If you're sitting in a wheelchair and you're really slouched down and you have poor posture in your wheelchair, you could be placing unnecessary pressure on your bottom, on your back, shoulder blades, other parts of your body, and that can compromise your skin integrity, particularly if you're somebody who doesn't have great sensation on your bottom or in those areas. Similarly, braces can be have the same challenge. Um, we often see if somebody has a, has a new AFO or um, they're suddenly getting swelling because it's summertime, so maybe they're getting swelling in their lower legs and their braces suddenly went from fitting to being a little bit tight, a little bit snug. And if that edema or that swelling is, is rubbing on those bony areas of the foot and the ankle, coupled with decreased sensation, that can compromise that skin integrity and it can contribute to an ulcer or or some type of skin breakdown. So really important to just be cognizant of the, of the fit of your devices and, and have your healthcare team monitor that for you. So what we've seen in clinic too, and, and I'm sure Mandy deals with this a lot, is hesitation to move to the next progressive device. Um, and that is a tough deal. I mean, moving from a cane to a walker, and there's no question about it. Um, that's a, a loss, however, um, I don't know, sometimes you just have to flip it around and say, well, there can be a gain here too. So the gain could actually be in preventing a fall or overuse. So for instance, a, a person who is using a walker and really using their arms or overusing their arms uh, because their legs are not able to move through, what happens after a period of time, the shoulders and the arms, um, really get arthritic just because of all that strain. So there's some pros to going to these devices that can be helpful and beneficial. Um, you know, with at certain times that you can go back to another device if it's safe, but the, the important thing is that you wanna be able to get there for a lot of years. Right. And I think too, sometimes people are concerned that if they use a different device or maybe they start using wheel mobility like a scooter or a, a wheelchair sometimes that they're not going they're going to lose what they do have but often what happens is when they use a, a, a wheel mobility if we use that example they're able to do more and then the movement that they can do for their legs or the exercise they can do for their legs can be more targeted it can be more yes. effective yes. and actually it can have greater benefit than them um, than trying to struggle using uh, a walker or trying to continue walking. Yeah, so just like Kathy said, it's kind of this give and take. It's this give and take of not allowing your world to shrink and making sure that the assistive device that you choose and that you're using allows you to do what you want to do. So we'll just touch on this as well. Transfers. Transfers can be a common mobility problem that many folks have. Fortunately, there are lots of options. Um, we can do some arm strengthening exercises. I think we demonstrated those lovely triceps extensions with Kathy's beautiful triceps <laughs> earlier. You can use other devices like sliding boards, transfer poles. So sliding boards are just a long board where you just scoot your way from one surface to another. Transfer poles are like a, a long pole that attaches to the ceiling and anchors at the floor. It's strategically placed generally by a bed or between a bed and a chair that allows you to use your arms to perform a pivot transfer. Patients call these uh, uh, shiver poles, and they do kind of look like that. I'll give them that. So that's, that's another option. Grab bars, people are quite familiar with grab bars, but can be beneficial when strategically placed. 
sometimes simply adjusting the height of the surface that you're trying to complete the transfer from can be all that needs to be done in, in order to approve the transfer. Um, the, a huge problem for a lot of people are um, our couches, they're so low. Couches can be quite low. So sometimes something as simple as putting two by fours under the legs of those couches can bump it up just enough that you can get in and out of that, that couch or that chair with more ease. Uh, pulleys can be helpful. Trapeze, uh, making sure you have bed rails in your bed, um, considering some different automation both in chairs and in your beds. And then lastly, Technique, being cognizant of the transfer technique and that it's slow, steady, cautious, and strategic to make sure that um, you are safe. Do you have any comments on that, Kathy? I, I just maybe a comment on uh, trapeze, which um, I see a lot of, we do house calls in my practice, and I see a lot of uh, persons who are in bed a fair amount of the time, not a lot. I mean, the goal is to get out and to get going. but. Trapezes have been very successful for us if they're used in the right manner, mm -hmm. and there's education, but especially for the biceps and triceps. And so I have some individuals who are really pumped mm -hmm. uh, by using a trapeze. So they pull themselves up uh, for the bicep, switch the hands around, and then get the tricep. Mm -hmm. So very effective. Um, of course, you got to watch for um, safety issues, but it's been, it's been good and it's empowering because when you when you can feel your mus muscles and you can feel strong, that's empowering. Yeah, absolutely. So we know that you all know that bowel and bladder can impact getting there too and mobility. And in fact, the most common um, challenges of people with MS are urgency, frequency, incontinence, and then there is retention too. And that's something that really does need to be dealt with if you're unable to go. But usually people will in, um, avoid places because they can't get to the bathroom quick enough or safe enough, and there can be incontinence. Well, believe it or not, 32 million Americans deal with incontinence on a daily basis. And over 23% of women over the age of 60 have incontinence. Wow. So it's not just MS. I mean, it's a, it's a rising problem as we age. So now more than ever, there is a whole bunch of stuff to do, including like better pads, better briefs um, for men, even carrying a urinal or a small device to urinate in. So incontinence is a problem, and I know it can be embarrassing, but again, you know, there's a lot of Americans who have this problem, and because of the, the better materials we have, you can still get out, you can still get there. Um, medications can be used too, and it's always good to have a urologist. I um, always tell my patients that they should probably see their urologist once a year. Mm -hmm. um, there are newer and better catheters nowadays. Sometimes, certainly catheters, we want to avoid those as much as possible, but sometimes when people are rushing to the bathroom and falling, um, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, a decision that takes a lot of thought and a lot of discussion, but uh, catheters uh, can actually improve quality of life in some cases. Uh, so we have a whole lot of things and a variety of things to, to help incontinence. So hopefully that doesn't prevent you from getting there. So sometimes improving mobility isn't just managing all of these symptoms that we've spoken about today. Um, sometimes it goes beyond that. It goes, it incorporates and includes seeking out those physical therapy and occupational therapy consultations, having someone come to your home and really look at your situation and saying, hey, what can what can be improved upon here so I can get out, so I can do more, so I can live my life the way I want to. Maybe it's transportation. Um, go ahead, Kathy. And transportation in most, especially larger cities, tends to be a very big problem uh, to serve people with disabilities, especially people um, in wheelchairs, so paratransit systems, those sy symptom, systems that cities and counties offer tend to be um, 
not great. So I think we all have to advocate for ourselves, um, especially when it comes to things like that, because at least the, the, per, the persons I serve in clinic, if, if they can get out, if they can get out of their house into the community, they can so much improve our community because it turns out that people are so talented um, that, I mean, there's disability, but the ability in the disability is so much bigger and it helps everybody's community. So we have to work to be able to get people out um, of their homes if they choose to. Right, we, have to, we, want, we want to engage people. And you have all abilities. Yep. Sometimes tele uh, programs can also be helpful if, if a person really can't get out of their home. And I think Mandy actually has a tele exercise in her practice. Yeah, so you can consider that as another option. If it is difficult to get out consistently, trying to engage socially and avoiding that isolation by using technology, even though we had a little technology glitch earlier <laughs> tonight, but using technology, FaceTiming people yeah. and having those video conferencing to, to engage and enjoy enjoy the company of others, really, really important. But you can also be a more formal advocate, Yes. right? So you can invite, advocate for your accessibility in your community. Absolutely. So I'll let Kathy share, because she does a lot of that for our local community. So um, I think we all need to speak up. And I think um, in my practice, there, there are individuals um, that uh, generally in wheelchairs that are underserved, especially with transportation, and are not able to access their communities. So it's important that we, that you, you with lived experience, um, advocate for everyone out there. Um, I think it's probably worse in rural areas. Um, sometimes it's actually better because those communities help each other too. So, but we have to be able to access our community. That's what makes us well and fun and we can laugh and there's so much talent there. We have to have our community accessible for everyone. So we don't want to lose it. We don't want people to avoid exercise and avoid engagement in their community. We know that exercise can be a really effective intervention for improving quality of life, improving improving mood, and potentially improving some cognitive symptoms. We just know that the impact is so tremendous. So optimizing that mobility and, and really allowing yourself to engage to the best of your abilities can have profound impact on overall quality of life. So that said, Randy, our dear Randy, is, white, is right and has been right all along that the key to managing disability is mobility. So we hope you all get there. Get where you want to go. All right, thank you very much, Kathy and Mandy, for that great information. And uh, for the folks at home, uh, you'll be able to click on uh, some of these sources and some of the hyperlinks um, and and see some even more more resources. Uh, so thank you for watching tonight's presentation. Uh, we do have time for for a couple of questions. We know people uh, have submitted during the program and during registration. So I want to make sure that uh, we get to a couple of them. And if we don't get to them, I will tell you about some additional resources where you can ask your questions. Um, so uh, real quick, uh, Kathy, I just want to start with you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the benefits that Botox uh, can have with bowel uh, and bladder symptoms. Um, is, are there also any benefits related to spasticity and sort of leg, uh, leg pain that, that Botox uh, may be helpful with? Yes, um, absolutely. So Botox is helpful generally for more um, limited muscle groups. So um, if you have spasticity in numerous larger muscles, it isn't as effective, but certainly um, smaller muscle groups, uh, absolutely. And the benefit of Botox is that it doesn't have that general effect of, you know, potentially fatigue, uh, drowsiness, and maybe some additional weakness. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, are there any uh, new products 
uh, that you're aware of, specifically with drop foot and imbalance um, that may also be, be effective? So I would can encourage people to keep their eyes open for additional functional electrical stimulation types of devices that are out there. Um, we also commented on the emerging evidence about the vibratory insoles and textured insoles. Um, there are always an assortment of mobility um, technologies that are out there. If you do a simple Google search, you can find a lot. So again, I think it's working with your rehab team, working with your healthcare team and figuring out where are the challenges and what are the true legitimate options that are available to you because you could spend a lot of money on things that maybe aren't as optimal or as effective for you in your situation. There's a lot out there. So it sounds like communicating uh, with your with your healthcare team and, and finding what, what's working for you is is, is paramount. Uh, so speaking of a communication, uh, we received a lot of questions about communication, um, and specifically how the person with MS uh, talks to their family about maybe introducing some, some mobility aids and if they're scared about that, and support partners trying to talk to the person with MS to encourage them to, to introduce some, some mobility aids. Um, in your practice, and it, it's such an emotional uh, issue of, of mobility, um, how do you kind of break through some of those emotions and fears um, to, to, to encourage people to, to take advantage of some of these uh, options that are out there? So I'll, I'll start with this. So I think what's key to emphasize is, is less the mobility aid or whatever the aid is we're considering and more about what it's going to enable you to do. So if you're a support partner and you're wanting your loved one to start using a walker or a mobility aid because you want them to be able to go to dinner with you again or you want to be able to go on a walk with them again, it's not about the mobility aid. It's not about the wheelchair. It's about wanting that person in your life and a, and a part of your world. So similarly, if you're a person living with MS and you feel like your world is, is shrinking a little bit and, and a tool can help you re-expand that again, then, then it's something that needs to be explored. And I always tell folks, you don't have to be married to one a piece of uh, mobility equipment. You can be flexible and you can use what you need when you need it and then don't when you don't. And if your mobility doesn't allow you to do what you want to do, then it maybe isn't the right choice and you need to go back to the drawing board. That's a great point. And uh, with so many mental challenges and roadblocks, uh, in addition to a great physical therapist and, and nurse practitioner, it sounds like uh, a therapist or a mental health professional is definitely someone to have on your, on your healthcare team to kind of help you with those uh, internal uh, ad adaptations. Uh, so we, we're kind of running out of time here, and uh, so we have time for one more question, and it's it's one that we we get a lot. Um, so with MS, uh, you mentioned you know people are going through lots of other issues, whether it's just sort of normal aging or, or other or other health conditions. Um, how do people tell whether uh, muscle tightness or spasms or rigidity? Uh, how do how would someone know if if that's being caused by MS or by some other by some other cause? I think sometimes it it is a bit difficult uh, with some symptoms, and some of those um, kind of accentuated aging symptoms can actually uh, be influenced by MS. For instance. If um, your gait is different with MS, you may be more likely to develop arthritis in certain joints. So um, sometimes they're interrelated, but I think it's important, um, and it is complicated. And many times it's very complicated. So I think you just have to sit down with your provider and really figure things out. Another example would be, you know, if we talk about bladder and with males, um, urinary dysfunction or frequency, I mean, can it be a prostate issue, which really needs to be looked at um, sooner than later, if that's the thing. So I, I think it's really a discussion where you have to sit down with your healthcare provider and really look at things and analyze things and really have some meaningful conversations. And then you come up with, yeah, I think it's mostly related to your MS and this is, you know, kind of what we can do with that. 
but it isn't, it can be complicated. Some things are relatively straightforward, other things are not. Right. Um, but we're all aging too. Right. And, <laughs> and sometimes it's less about what, what the cause is as much as what can be done about yes. it and exploring the yes. options to manage it and, and, it, and how it impacts function and how it impacts yes. mobility. So that's, that's what you would continue to investigate. Well, those are great answers and uh, great questions. Thank you for everyone for submitting those. Uh, and thank you for watching this presentation. For more webinars and other resources, please visit the CanDo MS website at canDo-ms.org. In addition to our monthly webinar series, I encourage you to submit your questions to the Ask the CanDo team where we will try to get them answered by one of our programs consultants. And please keep an eye out when one of our in-person programs is coming to a town near you. Mandy and Kathy, thank you so much for your time this evening. And we thank you everyone for joining and hope to see you next time. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.